essentially, uh, the um, panel really came about um, two years ago when uh, I started us having conversations with many women about the same topics, about trying to feel confident in their jobs and in a workplace climate, um, and having some conversations with Lewis uh, and dealing with a variety of issues. Um, and uh, really, we just thought, let's try to create a space um, where uh, individuals um, young in their career can have the opportunity to talk to senior managers and um, tenured uh, academics or about to be there. Um, just someone, someone who really has um, pretty much been established in their, in their um, respective career. So uh, Lewis and I have brought together um, today a really great mix of panelists. Um, we have uh, Kelly Bush at the end, Mary Rossi, Ben Ford, and uh, Bill White who will be joining us momentarily. So um, I'm going to have uh, each of them give a brief introduction and, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of get into things. I'm Kelly Bush, and I own a small consulting firm here in Washington State of in Skagit County, which is north here of Seattle here. And I've had, I do archaeological consulting. We've been doing it for maybe 12 years, and prior to that, I worked as an archaeologist up in British Columbia. That's me. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Rossi, and I live in Bellingham, Washington, which is 90 miles north of here about 20 minutes from the Canadian border. And uh, I'm currently uh, doing CRM consulting under a nonprofit structure. So it was kind of um, dumb luck, really, that that opportunity was available when I was ready to go out on my own. But it's really served me well, I think. Um, it's kind of unique, which can be good and bad. It's not a whole lot of people doing it that way, but I do a lot of tribal Archaeology consulting, and I think it's it's helped me in certain ways to you know, set up a new nonprofit. Before that, the the nonprofit grew out of my experience working with the Lummi Nation um, in in the aftermath of one of our state's unfortunate archaeological disasters. So that work motivated me to stay in that arena and, and strike out on my own. I'm realizing almost ten years ago. Uh, I'm Ben Ford. I teach at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which is a remarkably important institution. Uh, over by Pittsburgh, uh, so it's with Western PA. Uh, I've been there about six years now. I'm a, I'm a water archaeologist by training, though I mostly teach historical archaeology. I do research on the Great Lakes primarily. And others. I, I'm Lewis Jones. Uh, I am a PhD candidate, actually all but done, almost done, uh, at Indiana University, Bloomington, in Indiana. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Thank you. And as I said, this is, the, this is the third year we've done this, and we've touched on a lot of issues over the past couple of years, um, looking at the impediments for young professionals coming into, coming, trying to come out and succeed, to get that first job, and it's not just necessarily once they finish, it's what they're going through in graduate school to get there. What are the obstacles, whether it be related to class, gender, sexual identity, race. Um, and the, in the first year we were in Leicester, and of course, as we found out, there are different issues based upon what side of the pond you're on, actually. Um, in London, in England, in Europe, it's more class-based than a lot of ways. Um, as we found out when we were talking in Quebec, a lot of the issues with both class did play a role, but then there was the issues related to gender, gender identity, specifically racism, um, sexism, ageism. And so, I mean, it's, it seems like as we built up each year, it's all been leading towards where we're at today. And so, it, it, it's one of these things where, well, we all, well, let's not beat the uh, elephant in the room. How, how many people have heard about the report that was released recently about sexual harassment in field schools? It's the Kate Clancy. Yeah. Okay. 
I mean, now, not all of us may acknowledge that, that we've seen it, but I'm pretty sure a lot of us have had some experiences, at least in our own work, where it, even though it may not be us, we might be aware of things that happen. And so I, I've got my first question actually for the panel. Well, before you get no, into that, actually, um, it did seem that most of the individuals in the room are familiar with it, but um, just as sort of a brief synopsis, um, of, and anyone else can maybe jump in on what they, they really took away from it. Um, but uh, uh, Kate Clancy and a number of her, her colleagues um, sent out a uh, social media uh, questionnaire and about individuals' uh, experiences Bill White is now joining us. Yes, yeah, sorry. You're all right. You're all right. Uh, Bill White is a PhD student at the University of Arizona. Yep. And we're just jumping in on um, talking about uh, the uh, Kate Clancy article and uh, sexual harassment in right. the sciences, okay. um, but particularly in anthropology. So uh, these individuals. Um, got, I believe, 666 respondents. They didn't, you know, try to focus on um, a particular gender, but um, they did receive, I believe, more responses from women. Um, they did identify uh, uh, that men who did respond, uh, some of them had actually experienced sexual harassment as well. So what they saw was women were seeing sexual women who are experiencing sexual harassment were um, experiencing it from the top down. So basically su superiors were the individuals who were um, creating these difficult workspaces. Um, but men, m most of the men identified in this study discussed that they were receiving sexual harassment uh, from their peers. So for women, uh, they they discussed that it seemed overall a lot harder for them to stay in um, in the sciences because there wasn't the support structure needed. As well as they identified most uh, field programs don't actually um, really bring up sexual harassment procedures. Um, so, uh, so for so while men were dealing with it on a peer base, it wasn't necessary, it, while it was still, um, I'm sure, very problematic, um, because your peers don't necessarily affect the way uh, you advance in, in your, your career, per se, as a supervisor would. Well, and, and, that, and that's one thing where I have a disagreement wanna, because actually, okay. Peers do affect your advancement, they do. Quite because they do. they're going to be the ones who are going to go, who have to speak up and support, for example, if you're going for tenure, because you're going to have to have peers who are going to write recommendations, whether they be within your program or outside. Um, and they can be male and or female. Uh, I mean, the, the takeaway for me from the report was the fact that the sexual harassment is ongoing in our profession. Um, people are now acknowledging that at the same time it's only a small minority of us who are acknowledging there's still a pushback from the um, ivory tower, so to speak, against the idea that this has been going on. Because I mean, and I've heard some people even walking through saying, I don't know why people are saying there's sexual harassment. It really isn't happening. And it may be that they've turned a blind eye to it. And, and that's the concern because, I mean, and I'll use my, pro my program, for example, we never talked about sexual harassment as an issue when we came in the program. When you go through the orientation as a grad student, we're told about all the problems you have to deal with. We're told about the economics, um, the time factors, how much the time to dissertation, the time to the PhD, what's expected of you to succeed. But they don't talk about the things you might have to get navigate with specific advisors who may decide to pressure on you to do certain things if you want to be able to one, if you want to go to my field school, you need to do this, this, and this. Otherwise, I'm not going to take you. Um, if you want to be my TA, here's what also I expect of you outside of your normal duties. And those things do happen, but they're not talked about 
when you come into a grad school. When when a student comes, when you go into, when I, I remember when I went out for interviews to grad schools, I'd ask them, what's the <clears throat> environment like? Not one person ever said, well, well, there are this professor, this professor you want to stay with from the business and this. Now, if there's this, if there is sexual harassment going on, grad students do know about it. I mean, and the problem is they feel suppressed. They feel that if they say something, they're going to feel the repercussions. And there's a similar feeling in CRM. I, my background is in CRM. Um, I am the archaeology program manager for. Um, for the Fort Walla Walla Museum, and uh, I run a contracting department within the museum. And so there's a, a bigger concern uh, in the CRM world. You have field, so there there is health and safety that you're supposed to get when you go out into do field work. Um, I think more often than not, uh, the sexual harassment procedures don't make it into that uh, health and safety discussion. Um, but even so, uh, many um, field techs, when you're trying to advance, if there's something going on, um, because your position is so temporary, um, you're more concerned about getting a callback for the next project that you might not say something. So, um, so I think to maybe uh, start getting a dialogue going, um, just uh, I don't know, working from Kelly up, just getting um, some uh, perspective on um, the, the article as well as uh, your thoughts on how to maybe um, advise um, young, young people on how to, how to, yes, maybe deal with the issues and, and what they should do. Sure, I'll pull advice. Um, <laughs> so I did read the article. I know, lame. I apologize for that. Um, but I'm getting the gist of what it um, what it's talking about, and I think that um, this is true in plenty of field sciences, but it's probably true in all sorts of industries. Is, and it, it sort of moves down to a power imbalance. And certainly, running a CRM firm, even a small one, um, we deal with power imbalance every single day inside my shop when we're on field um, crews, when we're working with construction workers, the bulk of the work that I do is on projects where they're building something. So I have um, one archaeological monitor out on a $70 million wastewater treatment plant construction project with 120 construction workers. And there's, uh, you know, it requires superhuman planning and, um, you know, and careful education to try and level that playing field so that the archaeological monitor isn't, isn't in a position where they're um, really, really being bullied into doing or saying things that they uh, can't or shouldn't do. Um, and then it, it, that's not a sexual harassment example, but it's a real example of, of power imbalance, and it is something that we deal with every day. And inside my shop, you know, there's a dozen of us, and even so, where we've known each other a long time and we've worked together a long time, there's always power imbalances in those settings, and um, as individuals in a, in a working team, you have to constantly pay attention to not letting yourself um, either uh, be compromised, or feel compromised, or appear compromised. And one of the things that I tell all the young people I have lots of people who come in as shovel bums, uh, field techs who are just in for a few weeks or out for a few weeks, is um, there isn't a job on this planet that's worth eating shit for. There's the deal. Don't do it. If you do it, then somebody else is going to have to do it and nothing will stop. So if that's happening on my job site, I want to know about it. But if it's happening on other job sites, walk away. I get that some people think, oh, I can't walk away from this job or I can't walk away from this opportunity. There is no way that you're going to be able to take the power away from these people if you don't um, speak the truth. And it's always hard and there's always a cost. You're going to lose some money, you're going to lose some time, and there's going to be people who don't like you. But if you don't speak the truth when you're starting out, it's just going to get harder and harder and harder. And um, that's the big advice that I give people who come through my shop. 
speak the truth. If it's me and my shop, I want to hear about it. And if it's somebody else's shop, you need to you need to say it, and you need to be willing to give up what it is, whatever it is that they're holding over you. Let it go. Do you, Kelly, have a um, uh, sexual harassment procedure in your um, employee? Got a no, I don't even have an employee handbook. <laughs> <laughs> We're a pretty small shop, but um, it does say speak the truth. But we do have, um, because we have power imbalance issues that come up. I mean, pretty much every single staff meeting. I mean, it's I had it this this morning. So 7 a.m. I'm getting a string of phone calls, and I've got to monitor in a construction site situation, and it was all about power imbalance, and it was, you know, so it's it's an every single day. And so, no, we don't have a policy because we don't have a manual, but we deal with it all the time and we just constantly brainstorm on strategies. And sometimes it's for workers who are what you consider temporary workers, and sometimes it's in situations where we have a permanent staff person who's in a situation where they're not, that, they're not being successful there. For whatever reason, the guys are harassing them, the client doesn't respect them, so we just find a way to get them into a different position where they're not stuck there. So we don't have a policy on it, but honestly, it is so common and it is so much about uh, so much a part of the daily conversation that we're just dealing with it all the time. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm like Kelly, but on the East Coast, and it's usually just me. And I was at a site this summer, and this morning safety briefing with 50 construction workers, and I'm the only woman. And one of the guys says to me, what does your husband think of this? Like, my husband would think, I'm going to work, you know, what does he think? And that, that was my response to them, but I'm just thinking, what a weird question. And um, so anyway, but she's absolutely right. It's, it's something on a daily basis. And every day that I have anybody working for me, I always have a conversation about this. It's not like we have a meeting. It's not like there's a, a handbook. It's not anything that is, uh, you know, uh, written down any place. It's just a conversation that happens on a daily basis. You know, particularly for women, you're going to be out there with a group of guys if you're working on a construction site. It's just the way it is. Even if they have a token woman or two, they're doing another job. They're not archaeologists. And as archaeologists, particularly when you're in a monitor situation, in effect, you are in control of the site. I mean, you can stop their construction if you find something. And so you do hold the power. So it's very, um, it's a very uh, precarious, tenuous kind of thing. And, and some people are good at it, and some people just aren't. And I don't, I don't know if it's because, you know, I, I probably a little bit like Kelly, you gotta have a mouth. You gotta, you gotta say what is going on. You gotta be able to say this doesn't fly, you can't do this, or um, else you're just not gonna survive in the environment. And for people who have a difficult time with that, um, but I think capable of that, I advise them always, you've got, you just, no one is gonna stand up for you in this world except for you. You have to be able to say something. And if you can't say something, you really need to find another job. I was going to say that um, in the last two years, one of my worst cases of harassment and power imbalance was with one of my male employees. And he was getting picked on in a way that was uh, um, unforgivable. And it was a difficult, um, complex setting where we are in a long-term project and where we had um, more than one uh, group of people working on this site and he was being picked on because a bunch of the guys from the other crew liked his girlfriend. Um, it took me a while to wade through this, right? And But they were um, picking on him in a way that was dangerous and hostile and I didn't know what was going on. I could, you know, when it when it was starting to rise up, so that it got to me. It was like, okay, and I just plucked him out of there. But when I started to wade through it, it was like, wow, this is what is ha this is how it was all happening. And so then I sat down and talked with both he and the girlfriend, and then I talked with the supervisor of the other crew. And it was still better for me to pull those two people off and put them onto another job. But <clears throat> it had already, ex you know gotten to this place where it was awful. He was putting up with serious, serious crap. And it was a great opportunity for me to say to him, you know, that's why I'm here. I am here 
to provide a safe and non-hostile work environment. You have to come to me, you have to talk to me, you have to tell me these things. And we, at that particular job site, the, the best thing we ever did, because we had a lot of um, temporary workers moving in and moving out, the best thing we ever did was instill a weekly staff dinner. So Wednesdays after work, company bought dinner for everybody, and I facilitated the first five or six sessions and we talked the truth. And after that, I had the field director facilitate the meetings, and it was casual, it was fun, um, and they talked about difficult things. Sometimes there was tears, but what it did was it created a, um, this team, this sense of team, and after that, they took care of each other, and they all were willing to come to me with problems, and we were able to diffuse them really quickly. But, yeah, it happened. it's happening all the time, every day, every single day. So you just have to keep working it constantly and pretending that it's not there. It's not solving any problem. And it's, it's you know, this is CRM, but it's, it's in academia, it's everywhere. Shall we move on? Our next setup is Mary. Well, I have a question first. Where I like start launching what I think about this. <laughs> I want to make sure I know what it's talking about. Um, I have a confession. I'm not a historical archaeologist. Yeah. I'm a cultural anthropologist. Oh. <laughs> with some, uh, <laughs> I know, with some um, archaeology experience out of the need to eat. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, um, I did skim the article. Was not able to read every word, but I wondered if the um, team that did the study, if they then linked their findings back to sort of um, society at large, because I have heard so many things lately yeah. about non-reporting just in society as, as a whole. So I wondered if they they did a bit. They um, did try to actually tie it a bit into whether or not this is um, a cause for why women are um, are leaving STEM. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, there was definitely the STEM linkage, and I uh, can't remember if there was something else right now. They, 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 they were not getting promoted in STEM because of the STEM. That was the other reason. Yeah. It, it, I mean, they talked about the. Look correlated to lack of promotion from STEM, lack of promotion within the academy. Um, they, they didn't go into wrong numbers as far as how the pair society, and because that's what's still definitely. But this, and they even really emphasize the fact that this needs to be on the look up ongoing so that we can get a real clear picture and understanding of just how pervasive is this. If it's pervasive in our field, Pervasive with the academy, how pervasive is this across society right. and affecting opportunities for people, regardless of what their background is? Uh, I mean, and they're pushing for the idea that we need to be studying this. We need to be looking at it seriously and determining how it's affecting our ability to succeed. Yeah, you know, the, the, the reason I asked is because I anticipated that, you know, as we talked today, you know, it would be, you know, like you were saying. Sexual harassment occurs in society, our society, every day, all the time. Probably most of us in the room have experienced it at some level or another and had to decide, you know, is this something that I need to, to report? Is this serious? Do I let this go? Um, and then, you know, so I assume that would be part of the discussion and that it would be, you know, in your at whether it's workplace or academic institution, are there those mechanisms? If you needed to report something, you know, would you? And then how would you do it? And and I'm I'm kind of in the I'm a one person shop, um, so I'm in the sort of yeah you know speak the truth you know someone treats you bad you know don't stand for that I think that makes sense. But clearly, then there's uh, a disconnect if, in our society as a whole, people are not comfortable reporting and doing something about it. It's, it's really easy to sit here and say, oh, yeah, I wouldn't stand for that. But, you know, it's been a while since I was in the field, but I thought back to, you know, the times I was. And, and you know, the field is, uh, I grew up playing sports. 
and uh, kind of outdoorsy, and you know, you behave differently, you know, on the on the job site sometimes than you do at you know the Thanksgiving dinner table, or whatever. And um, you know, there's there. I was a tomboy, and you joke around, and you know, the the rules are different there. But when I thought about it, I was like, yeah, you know, there were some times where uh, I was a entry level employee and the shovel bombs were coming through and there were some things happening that I you know felt like I handled fine I didn't need to report but I think they would fall under you know sexual harassment and then I were I was a, a non-tribal member working in a tribal setting so you get certain you know might not even come sexual harassment but you're you're the outsider and you you know there's joking teasing you know that you can um, so I, you know, I have, it's not something I deal with on a daily basis. Currently, uh, it would be my dogs harassing me at my home computer, but, um, but in the past, you know, I have experiences to draw on. Um, but, so I was just wondering, I was thinking back to those times I was in the field, and luckily, I was on smaller crews, I was really comfortable with my direct supervisor. I'm certain I could have gone and, and talked to them about it, but you know, would I? You know, I, I'm not. Well, I'm not think sure. That that's a really good thing to bring up because in experiences I've had that weren't maybe necessarily sexual harassment, but just mm -hmm. were clearly inappropriate mm -hmm. behavior Hostile work environment. Fr from a supervisor. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel I. I felt my only option was human resources, and I felt that was too formal because I didn't want to lodge a formal complaint. Right. Um, so I just dealt with it, Which and, then, and, that, and now I just share it all the time. With <laughs> <you know. laughs> that, that does bring up a very important question, though, because it's so yeah, it's so easy when you are when you've reached essentially um, uh, an age or you know a length of time in your profession where you can really feel that confident to just, you know, be able to say and walk away and, and those kinds of things. But yeah, it, it really, you know, you, for me in particular, and I don't know about anybody else in this room, but, um, you know, I wanted to be in this profession for a very long time. So it's, for some people, it's not necessarily an option to just be like, nope, I'm not, yeah, and, and maybe burn some of those bridges, or maybe the fear of burning those bridges, you know, not maybe having someone to talk to more about that. So this was sort of a, a hope in this panel, um, was for um, people here to uh, feel confident to, um, to discuss any problems like this. Um, but anyway, uh, Marion. I have just a small yeah. comment. I think a lot of this flows from interventionalization like that. But as someone who's a managing staff, mm -hmm. it's important to me to make sure that I'm creating a space where my staff feels comfortable talking to me about anything. And the problem I always felt in graduate school, where I would certainly see this happening, I try and talk to faculty about it when I saw it happening. Students, staff, they need to know what the appropriate channels are. It's, yeah. and, and I did work at Michigan State in sexual assault prevention, working with the Department of Student Life and stuff like that. And what we would see when we instituted a um, prevention program, mandatory prevention program for incoming freshman students, reporting rates went up. And that was initially, the university was like, but we just instituted this program that's educating people. It is, it's educating them about what sexual harassment is, so they can identify it, and how to look for it. And I don't, I don't see that as something that, that we're providing. At no point in my graduate school, it, it, um, I didn't know there was an ombudsman who you could approach, <laughs> right? Independent of, you know, who, who is a safe, who is a safe place for you to go to talk about problems like that, where there's counseling services or any of that. So making sure everybody's staff and students actually know the channels and know to, are actually able to identify, put a word on, oh, that was sexual harassment. <laughs> that's what I just experienced, or that's what I'm seeing happen to another student or another staff member. 
and then creating a space where they feel confident that there's a safe channel to, to report it or if someone can talk to them about it. I think that's as, as managers, as people who are running sites and stuff like that, establishing that's really important. Well, Muckle wrote a nice um, short piece in SA's perspectives about how he or his field schools puts a sexual harassment policy into his syllabus and they have a conversation day one. This is what this is. This is unacceptable. It cannot happen on this site. It will not happen on this site. It will not be really kicked out. You know, we'll be able to the university or whatever system, you know. Zero tolerance, right? Um, and uh, that creates, that gives every field school student on that project. It's like, okay, my faculty member has my back, right? And uh, so create those atmospheres on the site and elsewhere. So, sorry, if, if I may, um, follow up on Terry's comments. So, you know, I'm chair of the ACUA, which brings its own load of things with it. Um, let me speak from a personal standpoint for a moment, then I'm going to toss my colleague here under the bus <laughs> to assist me. Um, but I can tell you, it's not just in graduate school. I mean, I work in CRM. I work offshore in CRM, so I'm out in oil and gas a lot. And I'm typically the only woman on the boat. Um, one of my previous companies, I was the only woman that was on our field team. And so I had an incident with one of our field supervisors on the vessel and had a very hard time raising it. Because when I did raise it, I knew what was going to happen was that no one was going to do a damn thing about it. We had a zero tolerance policy. And I had to reach the point where I finally said, I do this not for me, but for the poor sucker coming behind me. And Ironically, I was not the only one having the problem. There were several men on my project that had the same issue. And they then came forward. And it was a situation of, you know, I can't work here. I don't want to work here. You know, people are terrible human beings, and I want to go somewhere else. But I was, you know, I was eight, nine years into my career when it happened, and I thought, wow, I thought I was past all this crap. I mean, I thought I was past the point where you're afraid to go to your boss and say, there's a problem. And part of what drove that decision for me ultimately was that there was not a good way to say, I have a problem within my field. And so when this study came out, the ACUA looked at the study and said, you know what, we recognize this is a problem within the underwater side of the field as well. And in some ways, we're a lot younger than our terrestrial colleagues. Um, so there's a lot of Wild West in what we do which means that tends to bring a lot of really big tanks and macho guys to the program. Um, so we actually issued a statement this fall, and it's something that we're asking SHA and RPA and SAA to endorse um, that basically lays out what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, and what that policy is. And so Dave, who very kindly co-authored it, I'm going to toss you out here, talk a little about it. Well, a couple things. Um, the study kind of codified what we've all seen in our careers, and and um, and I will tell you that there are people here at this meeting, powerful, well-spoken, articulate, important people in our field that do not recognize that this is a problem and would far rather not talk about it. And clearly, we're all being too sensitive, and we need to go get some clean ass and go cry in the corner, which is bullshit. Um, <laughs> the the um, the study is has been sort of attacked because it's not a true scientific ethnographic study. It's a anecdotal reporting, but we don't need a true scientific study to prompt us to do the right thing. So um, you know, be that as it may, that's a red herring to to listen to someone say, "Well, it's not really." Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? We've seen, I've seen it, we've all seen it, and, um, you know, I uh, feel that my little baby, which is underwater archaeology, and, and I feel that, like, a lot of sort of new things or, or, or minority things, we need to be twice as good just to be half as good. And we need to set a standard for underwater archaeology that is as good as we can make it. And when we act like rum-swilling, skirt-chasing 
idiots, we look like idiots. Mm -hmm. And the, the field has a lot to offer in terms of insight into the, the uh, scientific documentation of the past. And there is a place and a need for, for women, for minorities, for people of different orientations. Those diversity brings relevance to our studies. And I think the, the, I'll just close by saying that, you know, I come from the National Park Service, and the National Park Service and most big companies have policies of about sexual harassment, about, you know, acceptance and diversity and stuff like that. The truth of the matter is, is, is that those policies are not about people. Those policies are about keeping the agencies and the institutions from getting sued, and nobody gives a crap who is important about whether women or minorities or whatever, regardless of the lip service that they're paying to it, are getting a fair shake in the field. And so the, the real change has to come from within the practitioners of the field to, to create opportunities for their junior colleagues and to also stand up and say, that guy is an ass, do not work for him, do not go on their field project and to spread the word informally throughout because that's the only way that change is really going to happen. The effectiveness of sexual harassment, the effectiveness of, of oppression it depends in, in an essential way on its um, being denied the light of day, occurring in, in, in isolated incidents and not being examined and not being discussed about it. So it is incumbent on all of us to not only not do it ourselves, but to speak up against it when we see it in the field. And that is the, the, the just briefly, the ACUA policy is basically a direct transplant of the Park Service policy of, against harassment in general and sexual harassment in particular. And I, we use that, the ACUA use that, because it's been vetted by lawyers, so it's got to be good, right? Um, but the, the other part of it, which is, um, you know, is unfortunate, is, is we, the ACUA, we are an organizing body. We have no ability to censure. We have no ability to, to adjudicate, um, a, you know, an allegation of sexual harassment, nor do we want to. You know, all we can do is provide an informal network um, and sort of a more formal means of communication about specific bad actors in the field or bad instances in the field and to continue conversations like this and to lay out a professional expectation of what is and is not acceptable in the office, in the field, on a boat, and, and everywhere else. And so that is, is what we've done. And honestly, the, the response has been phenomenal. Everyone has said, we need to do this. And, and, and Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I, I think just so we can get, uh, I, I want us to keep having a conversation, but also to help uh, Mary give, give her um, uh, thoughts on it. You, you started with these questions and wanted to kind of, to kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. uh, just to well, I'd ask the, the question because I, with my cultural anthropology, <laughs> I sort of take a, a big picture view of things and was just trying to relate it to these things I heard in the news, whether it's, you know, from the military or just, you know, society in general, non-reporting, you know, why is that? And are we being prepared? Um, you know, you're, you're, we're trying to speak to people who might be new, new in the profession and, you know, I, I just try to just start to see a big picture and, you know, why aren't we preparing people to be, you know, positive and know to speak up I and mean, if this is wrong, this is right, you know, and I'll we'll start going there, which is a bigger longer session, but um, I, uh, you know, and then I shared, you know, a few things on, ref and my initial reaction was, wow, you know, right now, current day, you know, one person shop, I don't, you know, it's more like with client interactions, and do I get certain jobs or not get certain jobs, that kind of stuff, but um, reflecting back on, you know, field, field days, and what, you know, what was happening there, and when I said something, and um, that, that's what the article, you know, kind of churned up in me and what I reflected on before today. So um, I'm not sure if I have I'm still I'm still sitting here chewing on those things. Okay. okay. So do you wanna go for it then? Um so to kind of pick up on what David Kim was talking about in terms of 
um, but they're they're sitting in the water. I'm sorry, I probably say in terms of power box. I guess we have two sort of vaguely related thoughts. Um, one is the power how power shifts and the perception of power shifts is sort of an important component of this. So I don't think of myself as an aggressive or predatory person. But I'm an incredibly <coughs> inappropriate to be. Like, um, and that's a product of just where I come from and my background. Uh, and, and I had to change that. Um, well, at least face shift a bit. Because when I was doing CRM, I was fine. And even if I was running the crew, you know, my mouth was not usually a problem. But I'm a professor. And, you know, it was brought home to me in that. You know, I was teaching an evening class with a bunch of graduate students, and someone made a, a, a double entendre kind of, kind of joke. And I let it ride. You know, I didn't shoot him down because, you know, we're trying to have a conversation. Um, but one of the students came to me a couple of days later, and she said, you know, how she, if she if he felt harassed or uncomfortable, threatened by this, this event. And it was, to me, it was, it was mortifying. It never occurred to me that that was, like, that was, that that was part of it. And, and, and I didn't perceive it that way. Her perception was that it was, it was appropriate, and, and that's what matters to me. Really. And that's the important part: is how she she took it. Um, and so I think managing those those perceptions. And to be completely honest, there's new archaeology all that's fun for me because I go out in the field now with a bunch of students, and I have to like mind myself. Like I'm, I I never just go dig anymore. I'm always on. Um, which actually is the advantage of underwater archaeology because I get like half an hour or so of just bedding time where I can just cuss at the ground underwater and no one can hear me. Uh, so that's, there is that. But, um, but it's, you know, it's, there's that, that shifting is, it can be difficult. So I think that sometimes, so it does have to do with you know, people sort of shifting their, their position and you know, not, not always adapting. The, the flip side of that though is, um, like Dave mentioned, these big institutions. So I'm at a 15,000 person university. So we got rules. We got protocols and we got rules. And in the wake of Jerry Jandusky, we got new rules. So that's what I am. Um, thank, thank you, Jerry. Um, so, uh, so there's, there's this rule that students are, like Terry says, students always know about. But one of the things that I find is that students come and talk to you about. And part of your job is to, to really direct them in the right, the right places. What I thought was interesting with the study is that the study mostly focuses on stuff is, is having a field, um, which I thought was not surprising because the field is a, is a, a world apart. We have this, we have nautical archaeology is the idea of life ashore and life afloat. And so some sailors were incredibly competent seamen, but just abysmal human beings on land. Um, and we seem to have a little bit of archaeology where you know, people can, can act right at a conference, but then they go, out of the field, and they're just like, just ape shit. Um, so, you know, there's the, sorry, I lost my train of thought, because I was making up stories. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 you know. The behavior. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and that, wow. <laughs> well, the, the I think ACUA fun. policy that, that we adopted explicitly mentions field work and, and Request that there is a standard of acceptable behavior set for everyone, irrespective of time or place. And thank you for giving me one of my scattered thoughts. Um, it's that, for me at least, I find it much easier to manage what's going on in the field because it's intimate and I can see what's happening. In the university, they're often labs and offices, and I got the faculty members running around. And so, for, for me at least, I can see what's happening. and I can use this to sort of newfound power and balance that I can be able to enjoy. Um, to fix things in the field much, much easier. I can, I can roll up on the back heads together and, and fix things. Whereas in the office and in, in the university, I find that, you know, I hear about things saying, hey, I never ever actually see anything. I just hear about it. And so it's much, much more difficult. Um, but to, to your point, I, I find that it can also be, and kind of give you that thing, use that, that power and balance thing that for good, right? that you can sort of help fix things a little bit. Um, and I don't have a company, but I'm a university that's unionized, so I'm a unionized tenured professor. So I, like, the fact that I'm wearing pants today says 
miracles. Um, <laughs> no, there's no rules anymore. Like it's just it's completely so I can I can come up to students and tell them that's being inappropriate and not worry about repercussions. So I can I can tell the faculty, you know, like, look, let's let's not let's not do that. I don't do that in front of students. I never really dress down to the faculty in front of students because that's that's also inappropriate. But uh, it, you know the power of being played is multiple selection. That's all right. I, I think I'll address the ways that I've seen it um, handled at other companies and, and uh, universities. So uh, my um, undergraduate, if you're an undergraduate, there's possibly a link somewhere that you could maybe click on, especially if you're an off-campus student. You never have any idea that there's any kind of complaint pipeline. So uh, as an undergraduate, I was kind of aware that it was inappropriate to harass someone. However, I had no idea where I could go. Uh, the field schools that I've been on uh, or uh, you know worked at didn't really address it at all. It was just, I guess, understood that if something was inappropriate, you were going to bring it to the uh, person in charge or your, or, or your crew chief. However, that didn't seem like it ever really you know happened. Uh, and then in graduate school, it, by that time, it seemed like it was very clear uh, what channels you follow, and uh, all the graduate students were trained in zero tolerance policies and universities. Uh, they made it really clear that this wasn't going to be happening at our school, and that if it happened to you, you had here's the, the pathway you go. And I can't say that I really ever saw too much um, harassment in the field uh, as a graduate student. But in cultural resources, uh, yeah, you know, you definitely see all kinds of stuff happening. And many of these companies do have zero tolerance policies and training uh, modules that we all have to take in order to, uh, to work there. Um, but that doesn't really ever seem like it, uh, um, it, it, it kind of turns into a situation where um, we've got a zero tolerance policy. Somebody doesn't like someone, someone brings something up, and that person's gone. Like, they're just gone, unless it's a supervisor then they're kind of never allowed to work with that other individual or kind of swept under the rug. Let's all forget about it. And so you were talking about the different perceptions, uh, you know, and uh, men can be uh, discriminated against, as we were just talking about, by situations that they're in from, from the other crews, especially like construction workers. It's bringing me, uh, uh, bringing to mind several situations where the construction crew did not like that I was there. They had their own zero tolerance policy, and I had to watch my zero tolerance policy and training, and then I had to go through their training and everything, and then I walked right off the trailer, and they just immediately, like, you know, I was less than them. I wasn't a real man. I wasn't, you know, doing the construction work, and I was just this jerk that was going to stop the project, someone that was just nothing but a nuisance, you know. But, um, it seems like the effort for all of us is to relate with these different crews, especially that aren't in our uh, company. Because we have these zero tolerance policies, and it really wouldn't have been difficult for me to raise a complaint for that guy to get taken off the project. But um, uh, the, the different perceptions you know, that everybody has about uh, harassment and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, you, know, you need to find that level. Uh, and if it's at a point where it's too high, you, know, you, have, you need to act to find uh, another kind of way to either um, solve that by going through their zero tolerance policy and having that person removed, or you can try to remove yourself. Uh, as a supervisor in cultural resources, you know, you just really have to play it by ear and get to know everyone before you can go away from the zero tolerance policy. So you have to know what's appropriate and what these individuals, you know, are okay with just basically by working with them. And so if, if you're in a situation where you've got a lot of temporary employees, you never know who you're offending. Just like you were talking about uh, issues that you didn't see, and then, you know, months later, all of a sudden, they're bringing it up, and you're thinking, well, I could have done something when that person was there, but now I can't really do anything. Uh, and then also uh, getting that uh, stigma of being the kind of person who does that, you know, that can ruin a young person's career. So taking them aside and describing, you know, here's what you did, and here's why it was not appropriate. Um, someone on the crew did not like that, and if you want to keep working in this, you might want to figure out whether that's the kind of thing you want to keep doing in the future. But then also being uh, tolerant enough to allow the uh, camaraderie of working in the field happen organically, 
to where sometimes stuff that is absolutely inappropriate happens doesn't end up with someone getting fired, you know. So if you've been working with these, you were saying about the, the no fun. I've worked with a lot of crews that, you know, they see a woman on the crew and they're like, oh, man, this whole project's ruined. Now we can't even be ourselves. We've got to watch every single thing we say. We can't behave the same way we are. And I've also been on crews where I was the only man, and I just had to keep my mouth shut because they were just saying all kinds of stuff and doing all kinds of things because they had all worked together and they were familiar. Uh, so trying to gauge what's acceptable and then telling them, you know, hey, I don't want to hear about that kind of stuff. You find that um, that balance point where you're not harassing anyone or hurting anyone while also not destroying someone's career by following the zero tolerance policy. Does anybody have any comments about those thoughts? I see Kelly's really pondering. Don't <laughs> pound it. <laughs> She's smiling over there. Why you're did you say that? that? No, no, I think it's all true. I, I'm thinking about some of the patterns. What I'm hearing is that sometimes it's easier for people to say something if they think it's a, a less formal setting, and that we might get higher rates of reporting if we had an informal option. And then you were saying that you're reporting it once you created a pathway, a clear pathway for people to report, then you get these higher um, levels of reporting. So if we can find a way to create um, informal, well-marketed, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of universities are now taking upon themselves to set up channels for sexual harassment reporting. The IU has done it on every campus. We actually have a vice chancellor whose sole purpose is to ensure that every student has has ability to, if they see sexual harassment, if they are sexually harassed, um, if they see any type of discriminatory activity, they have a safe channel to do it on every campus. And it came about, well, we, um, I don't know if we had, we've had a couple of students go missing over the past few years who were killed. Um, we've got one student who's still missing, um, and she was an undergrad, um, it's been four years now and we still don't know what happened. And because of these incidents, and they were all related to alcohol, and like it's, which is a lot, a lot, a lot, and a lot of times, we'll see, <laughs> let's be honest, when we see such harassment going on, whether it's in the field or what, somehow alcohol tends to have a role. People feel when they drink alcohol, it's more, it, they, they have a right to say what they want to say. And so it they control what they're saying. saying. And that doesn't excuse it, but it does happen. So in, in the case of Indiana University, um, Penn State had its issues um, where, for example, Jerry Sandusky was providing alcohol to young boys and things of that nature and sexually harassing them and, and more. And so a lot of universities, especially in the Big Ten, are now instituting these policies because of the fact that they see the need that students, students are scared. Yeah. I mean, we actually, at IUPUI, we actually provide, if you're leaving the classroom at night, you have a right as a student to call Camp security to have have a physical escort by an officer to your vehicle, whether you're male or female, because of the fact that we've seen incidents of sexual harassment. Um, there was an incident uh, five years ago at IPI to um, two gay students were walking along the sidewalk to class. Someone came along driving in a car, started screaming out obscenities to them through bottles at them. And it caused a major reaction within the community, within the university. Okay, what are we gonna, what, why is this happening? What do we have to do to protect our students? And it also filters down even into our programs. What are we doing to protect our students? Our graduate students, our undergraduate students, senior faculty, junior faculty, when these things happen. Yeah. I was just gonna say that I think that Formal solutions, in some ways, are the least effective solutions to problems of this nature. And the, the, the women that I see as powerful and successful in the field succeed in their own terms. Um, and I think that the, the you know raising allegations of, of harassment, unfortunately, is not the preferred option. Sometimes it's the only option, and we have to have that option. But I think that that what we can do in the field to help our, our younger colleagues is to provide and point to role models of, of people who have been successful in their own way. 
you know, and, and I, I happen to know some of my dear colleagues who are on the ACOA in senior positions can actually swear like a sailor, even though they happen to be quite petite um, young women who work offshore in the oil and gas industry. So, um, you know, and, and, but, but that's what it takes. It's not, it's like, you know, leave me the hell alone, you miserable piece of crap, you know, those, like it's the, the, the you know, the offshore industry, they push up on you to, like, you get on the boat and that's the first thing that's going to happen. What are you made of? And it's, it's, it's really feral in some sort of sense. It's like, how far can I push you? And, and, you know, those situations, like construction crews, same sort of thing, like, shut the hell up, I'm here to do a job, you are too, so let me do mine and, and you can do yours sort of thing. And I, I actually have a question about, when you're talking about, um, there's this, this dialogue about, you know, construction workers and this oil and shore, um, uh, non-archaeologists, individuals contributing. Um, I've actually, I just wanted to put it out there. In working in a CRM context, I've actually been, I guess, fortunate and not ever encountered any sexual harassment from construction people. It's always been internal. Well, and it also isn't even just them, you know, developer, local administrator, politician. I mean, they're all eight personalities and they can end up doing some inappropriate stuff that, you know, and communication and understanding the perceptions of, you know, what they're saying, they don't necessarily think that it's harassment or whatever, they're just flipping out. Or well, acting, acting, you know, it's inappropriate to us, they don't understand that until you say, that is inappropriate, this project will stop for five minutes for me to look at this bottle. That's all there is to it. But the, 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 that, the harassment is there, but the, the goal of the harassment is to further the project, not to necessarily, I mean, it's just a handle on you to get over on you to get you to do something else that they want to do, which is to let me not do what you know the clients that I'm supposed to do. I think it comes back to an equity point, and to your point that informal methods work better sometimes. Yeah. That you know the universities, yes, they're getting very programmatic in the way that they protect their students. But I think when you start looking at professionals, particularly young professionals, my entire team, you know, I've had to sit down with them and say, look, I'm going to send you to a boat, you know, and you're three tough guys, and you can handle this, and I have absolute faith in your abilities, but, uh -huh. you know, when the day comes that you're getting pressure because you need to speed up the job because it's, you know, $125 million job, and you're, you're the stopgap, you need to be able to push back, you need to be able to call me, you need to be able to say, hey, I need some help. And that's that's a very informal flow of information, but it's a power struggle. It's not yeah. necessarily sexual harassment. It's, right. it's an equity event, right? And so I think part of what we have to do for younger professionals and our younger staff is be able to say, here's the mechanism. It might be an informal mechanism, but I'm here to protect you, and I'm here to make sure that you're safe. And I think it's not necessarily the big events that are the problem, and I would bet it's all of you would agree with me. It's the pervasive small stuff yes. that happens day in, day out, minute after minute, and it may be okay the first week, and it might be all right the second week. By week three, it's you're done, and I'm it's escalating, and it's continuing to escalate because they're continuing to try to find what's what's the breaking point. At what point can I shut you off this job, right? And so I think that's part of the struggle. You know, it's it's. Dave's right in that our companies and our universities have zero tolerance policies, but they are there to protect the attorneys. It's how we interact with our colleagues that allows us to support them and to say to them, this is okay, this is not okay, and everybody has a different breaking point. And if you're at your breaking point on day two, by God, send up the flag and tell me, and let me help you. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this because I've seen a lot of crazy crap 15 years ago in archaeology. And one of the things that has kind of struck me about our job, <coughs> our field, is that it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird, right? I mean, we, we spend maybe half the time in, you know, t-shirts and shorts, bathing suits if you're underwater, and we spend kind of half the time in a shirt and tie and a nice business suit. It's, it's kind of a, a weird position, but above all, no matter what we're wearing, we're professionals. And 
one of the things, you know, when, when, when I've had the personal the, the, the pleasure, but also privilege to sort of mentor a field tech who aspires to higher position, that's one of the things I've told them is, look, you are a professional. I know your position sucks and you don't know what you're going to be doing Monday, much less a year from now, but you're still a professional. And I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, even how to like articulate that besides on a one-to-one -one basis or even how to, you know, operationalize that sort of thing. But that I find when I see a field tech who is slipping and maybe you know, drinks too much in the hotel or has trouble getting up the next morning. Not necessarily sexual harassment issues, but like just issues of being, you know, a good human being. Um, I find that sort of building a mentoring relationship with that person helps a lot. Um, and again, like I said, I'm not even sure how to, you know, put that sort of thing in place. And I can only speak for a CRM perspective. But. So the difference sort of is the kind of thing we, so I teach a class about CRM archaeology. One of the things we talk about in the class is, is dealing with non, non archaeologists at jobs. And we use, I use back a lot for those guys with most of my experience. Um, and what I always tell them is sort of along the same lines as what you're saying is that you know, you're the professional, you're the archaeologist, and you know, I think you're doing this a little bit right always, you're smarter than they are. So figure out whatever it is, whatever, however you have to deal with it. That's sort of what came up with the people. Is that you know the way I deal with my cooperators is going to be very different than the way that you know a hundred pound, twenty one year old woman deals with that cooperator. Um, we got different mechanisms for getting what we want, and, and so that's so that's how I always approach it. But I'm from sort of the, the context of the study and the context of, kind of the questions you were asking. I find that much easier to deal with because it's sort of that's a back operator. You got three weeks with them. You know, work with it. It's a, it's a huge issue. Call your boss. Call Kelly and get her to uh, to, to help you out. Uh, but it's that you know, it, that's, that sexual harassment in our field. I think is going to be a lot harder to deal with because you can walk away from that back operator. But you know, some some dirty old woman um, who's like she's trying to lasso me. You know, the the, the dance that. <laughs> I have a secret for being here, and you know, maybe they maybe send my tenure package out to her to review. I mean, there's a, there's a different, that's a different sort of relationship that, um, that I think is, is a little more insidious and a little bit harder to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, and I think that's the key part that the, I think that the whole report's bringing out that, you know, we could find mechanisms for a lot of stuff that's outside our profession. But when you've got to think about the fact that, okay, everybody here is my colleague, no matter where you're at. And if one of you is really making it hard for me to do what I've got to do to get ahead, because maybe you're saying, well, you know, you talk to my advisor and say things to undercut me because I'm not responding to you in the way you want, you know, how do you deal with that? Because you're, you're worried about just trying to get finished, maybe trying to get through tenure that first time, getting that first job. And you realize that everybody here is someone who can have an effect on your ability to advance in the career. So if that's the case, how do we make sure we're all protected, we're all armed, you know, for more who those people are that might not be people you want to associate with? I mean, because we, I mean, look, we've all heard the stories. It's, it's very difficult. You don't want to be appear to your colleagues to say negative things about somebody who other of your colleagues may respect or have a respectful relationship with. So it just makes it very, very difficult. And I personally, I'm just the kind of person that doesn't like to say bad things about anybody, even though there's some people I do like to say bad things about. <laughs> um, and I, I, I was personally in a situation like that, where even though I, I am, you know, my own, I'm the boss of me, I say. <laughs> That's probably like what Kelly says. You know, I'm, I'm a one-man shop, basically. You know, I occasionally hire people here or there to do specific projects, but it's usually just me. And um, I was in a situation where a regulator had asked me a question, and I answered honestly. And I could tell from the moment the words came out of my mouth, she misunderstood what I said. And I don't, to this day, do not remember what that was. I just remember the look in her face and the feeling that I got. And after that, she started treating me in front of her clients really poorly and trying to make it look like I was an idiot who didn't know what I was doing or what I was talking about. 
And I, I, you know, thank goodness I'm not an Indian, I do know what I'm talking about, and people on the other side of the table saw that there was a situation, or some of them see, some don't see people are just oblivious. And um, I, I had a conversation with her privately saying, is there any way that we can get past this? And I'm, I'm sure you, you misunderstood what I said. And if there's anything I could do or say to clarify for you. And she's just one of those kind of people who just, you can't have a conversation with her like that. So I said, another colleague who was familiar with the situation said, you're just going to have to wait. Time is just going to have to take its course before that, that situation gets passed. And it's still, I'm now in a situation where we can now have a conversation about it, and talk about how we both feel strongly and passionately about what we do. And, um, but, but it took years, and it's years to get to that point. So if you're in a relationship with somebody who is in your same field, who you're feeling a, a power relationship or sexual harassment relationship with that you can't confront directly or that you're not able to resolve directly and privately is I, I, I can't even imagine or tell people how to go or where to go. We don't have a body within our field that is come to us and we'll deal with it. Um, you know, how can you, and I, I know other instances of this too, for, you know, I, uh, not personally, but a very dear friend of mine in graduate school was harassed by one of her professors, and ultimately she dropped out of the program, and she just couldn't take it anymore. And and you know, thankfully, you know, at that point she was able to transition and still had a career for herself. But um, and, and later found out that she was not the only one, but she was not in a position to have anyone to go to to say anything to at the time. And uh, you know, life, you know, times have changed a lot now in universities where there are mechanisms for people to do things. But once you have started your profession and your professional life, other than having a direct uh, interaction with someone one on one to discuss the situation and hopefully diffuse it, if that can't be done, what do you do next? What's the next step? Who else do you talk to about it? It's very hard. It's hard to know who you can trust if you feel like you've been so burned. Karen? And that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important for again, managers, professors to, to establish a set of expectations of the people who work for them and to then hold them accountable for those things. Because it's, I, I feel like a lot of time when these conversations happen, of course, it's well, what can the victim of the situation do? Right? But there's also holding accountable the people who are perpetrating this behavior. That's the problem. Right. Um, it's one thing to have an appropriate channel for reporting, but it's another thing to eliminate that part of our culture that allows that stuff to happen in the first place. And so, you know, that's the question that I ask too, uh, especially bringing up the Sandusky issue, that we all know at these universities there's stuff that has happened before us, and those people are still there. Uh, and those zero tolerance policies, they were invented overnight. They existed already. Uh, and they existed from previous numerous incidences. So, um, yeah, you know, th I guess that is the real question. How do we tackle, uh, you know, this long-standing, you know, habit of this kind of stuff happening? That's really what the study says. Uh, incidents like the Sandusky uh, trial, um, it, it happens. People c close their eyes and look away, and years and years go by, and it can sometimes continue happening, and nobody says anything. I think that's so it was really carries on in the ECUA state. I think it's this is a weak weak sort of answer, but one thing that they do they're not they're not always enforceable, but the ECUA has been enforced now. Um, you can if you put a statement in your uh, your syllabus for your field school, you know, it's enforceable within the bounds of the university. What it, what these things do is they be to change the culture, and they change the sort of the environment. And I think that's as much as anything, that's that's an important component of this. You know, it's not a very good parallel, but like looking at like uh, a gay marriage, you know, that that is yeah. been a major shift, um, and it's a shift that it's happening legally, but it's happening legally because of a cultural shift. And when we can shift the culture uh, about letting power not as a channel, not just about. Okay. Um, I think that's that's a step in the right direction. These sort of statements you know, are, are part of the training for, for field techs and for students that when they become you know the established elite, then they're you know they, then the culture has changed. So, so how does SHA help? <laughs> right? I, yeah, I said this in the last symposium, I was in. I hate being in a symposium for real pop. We learned, oh, yes, sexual harassment's terrible, and then we leave. So, <laughs> right, what, 
what's, what, what can SHA do? What can this body of people do to, to help? You know, can you for, we develop frameworks for people to put in their syllabus, provide training about how to talk to students about issues of sexual harassment or um, how to build a, you know, how to run a team that is, I mean, we all have great work, collaborative discipline. Work in the field is collaborative based on teamwork, and you're not being collaborative if you are harassing each other. Yeah. And we have an ethical principle about right? freedom of dignity. And so it's great. Uh, it's in our ethics statement, right? So, um, you know, part of being an archaeologist is not being that. It's in our message. Yeah, that gets to the point. Okay, we've got the ethics statement. This is part of our ethics, but who's, going to, who's enforcing us? There's it, a lack of authority. You know, there's there's that, not that authority to say, you, if you are doing this, here are repercussions. We 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 are not a enforcement body, but we can each take it upon ourselves to act to see that things are enforced. We can we can if we see something going on. There's no we don't have to allow the person that's being harassed to solve to solve the problem. If you see it happening, you can take the appropriate steps to pull that person aside and say, "Look, I see you doing this. If you don't stop, here's what I'm going to." You know, I'm your colleague. I'm going to go to the people I need to to make sure that you're removed from this situation so that this is not going to continue. But, but that, that means we have to each take responsibility for each other to ensure that this doesn't go on. Well, so that's a skill set that requires training. training. So the same way that we have to have yeah. racism workshop, which is great. I mean, that's, yeah. that is, that's a hard thing to do as a manager, really hard to do as a faculty member. So, being, being able to identify for him. I mean, so, anyway. Well, just real quick, how many people in here has taken a sexual harassment training for their job or whatever? Well, because of my job? Yeah, no, not your life. Uh, it's really a work in progress. <laughs> but, uh, and, 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 but so, half of the people, it seems like half of the people have taken the training. And in the training, they do try to say, okay, here's what you do if you see this going on. Here's what you do if you are the one being sexually harassed. But, but, but let's look at the real problem. How many people feel comfortable enough in their own skin to step up and do those things? Well, well yeah, raise your hand. I mean, how many people? It seems like many of us already have. Whether we had no, training yeah. or not, Here's we had all tried at a, at a point if we saw something happening to stop it. Yeah. So it's like maybe our natural uh, tendency to try and stop this, like you were just talking about, Lewis. However, that came without training for half of the people in here. And it doesn't make it easy. It happens in public settings. I think most sexual harassment happens in private. You know, I would step up and stop something if I saw it. But in my 25 year career, I've been harassed again for eight months. Mm -hmm. I've only been bullied at once. The first one was private, but I've also seen another girl in my. You know, a colleague get by four or four Yeah, and that goes back to the repression thing that I was talking about about these long time. Uh, you know, maybe we're resigning ourselves to the fact that it's a generational change that we're just going to have to wait for it to, you know, weed itself out over you know years. I don't know how acceptable that is, but uh, you know. Yeah, I was just going to say it'd be great if we could put a catalyst on that. Yeah. Well, so, one of the things. Sorry. Um, one of the things I do when I have temporary field work that come through, which is all the time, is we have sort of a standard orientation. And one of the things I always tell them is learn how to communicate, understand how you're communicating with other people, both like with your words, but also with your tone and with your body language, because you can change how things, what happens based on those two things. You can't just rely on your words to be your communicator. And the other thing I tell them is to build alliances. And this is for the young people at the beginning of their career. Build, build alliances so that you have other friends at different levels and that you're talking to them. I mean, one of those other common themes is that nobody says anything or you don't say anything and then you find out later that there was 20 other people that were suffering the same pain that you were. And if we had those alliances in place, if we felt, you know, if we could talk to somebody about it, and then you'd find out, wow, yeah, the same thing's happening to Bill or whatever it is, then you would feel, you know, there would be some power and it would help sway that culture. I'm not sure how you would train young people to build alliances other than giving them communication skills. 
Yeah, sorry, I came in a little bit late, uh, so I didn't catch all the discussion. But you know, build, building on that a little bit, uh, I teach archaeological field schools, and uh, what I find a, a powerful mechanism is often peer pressure, uh, such that if there are certain expectations that are established early on in the process, uh, and the bar is set fairly, fairly high of what I expect of students, uh, then often they'll they'll come on board, and then. Students who maybe want to deviate from that uh, might not be inclined to do it so much because there's powerful peer pressure in a very positive way. Uh, and so, in other words, like a simple example would be people don't even gripe about a lot of things so much. You know, if they don't like the food in the field school, it's a hot day, or you know, because oftentimes uh, those those minor things can ultimately lead to uh, declining morale real, real quickly, and so on. So I'm not saying so much that we would squelch any any real problems, uh, but I find that kind of peer pressure too often creates an environment where where my people are sort of on their on their best behavior to to a great extent. So they're policing themselves in, in, in essence. Now, how would you now thinking about that same thing? Let's reverse it yeah. to where the problem is not necessarily from the participants in the field school, but maybe it's the person leading the field school or one of the other supervisors, field supervisors. How would you provide an avenue for those students to then feel safe? I feel that they, for example, come to you and say, hey, um, I was working over in this unit and this was sent to me by supervisor XYZ. I don't feel comfortable with that. Because most of them are going to feel comfortable just walking up to you and saying something. Yeah. So. Well, in addition to the sort of the, the group behavior uh, and the group solidarity that I try to construct, very early on in the field program, I also meet with each of them individually. So if there are sort of minor things or, or what, whatever, don't like my roommate, they stay up too late, they're drinking more than I'm sort of accustomed to, or whatever, that can emerge early on. And, you know, I try to nip it in the bud, so to speak, instead of letting it sort of fester all along. If it was my own behavior, I think the only recourse they have is basically to, to go above my head, probably. It should know, be very to intimidating. To the chair or to the dean or whatever. Which would be impossible, potentially, yeah. for most undergraduates. Yeah. Well, I, I am in a role that, you know, there is a power issue. So, I mean, I try to be cognizant of it, and I try not to abuse my position of power. I just want to uh, bring your question and your answer a little closer together because I think I think not just bad people can commit sexual harassment. Yeah. Yeah. People commit, let's yeah. say, microaggressions every day. So yeah. even if you are, you know, a really socially just person, you may commit these incidents of sexual harassment without even knowing it. So if you set up a relationship, like Mike is saying, where you have one-on-ones with your students and you have, you know, you know what's up, you know, you know, what's going on for you, how are things with the field school, check in with them, then you can kind of, like you said, nip those things in the bud in a one-on-one -on -one session, making the student feel comfortable. And I think maybe that same thing can work in a CRM field too, where, you know, the field, if you have the time, because sometimes you're so damn hairy, in the field, but you know, as a project director or, or, or a PI, if you can have that sort of one on one um, sort of session. But you know, again, it doesn't it doesn't help with the assholes in the world. It's only going to help with people who have the bravery to kind of accept their own weaknesses. Yeah, I've learned some of this through experience. We have them journal also on a weekly basis, uh, not so much note taking, but more about their own experiences. I mean, in one instance, it was at the end of the field school where someone wrote, oh, my roommate was, you know, drinking and waking me up at night, and I was like, I didn't learn it until, like, the last week, mm -hmm. right? So I've become a little bit more sensitive to that. If I can get that kind of information early on, then we can try to transform that situation. Luckily, I haven't been able to dealt with sexual harassment. I think that's really true about um, good people who can be offensive all the time. Like then, I grew up being offensive. I am an offensive person in Boston. Um, I blame my Canadian heritage on that. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's oh yeah, okay. So, but I do make it a point, you know, to create this place where my senior staff are able to, um, you know, tell me 
That was really um, offensive when you said that, or they'll crack a joke for me, or they'll pull me aside later, and um, that's been good for all of us, you know, because then we can talk about it. And uh, but I think that it's easy to be offensive, and if you don't, if you as a leader or a manager have not set up um, relationships with your peers or people who are just below you, but who are still high managers, where you talk about those things. Um, then you're not doing that part where you're identifying the uh, identifying and speaking it out. So it, it is good to acknowledge that um, sometimes, even even if you aren't offensive normally, how you say something there can, there can be the perception of something. Yeah, building alliances, considering communication. If you're not getting that feedback from people, you're not going to know where you're falling down on your communication either. Communication is a two way street. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This also, one question I have on these things. We've moved into the, you know, the why do people do bad things kind of place here. Um, and, and, you know, I'm assuming most of the folks in this room consider themselves good people or interested in these issues or self aware about these kinds of things. So, I mean, is, is one thing sort of as an organization we're going to try and, and sort of think about ways that good people can not make bad mistakes and they just hope that it's a really small minority that's actively being predatory or the things that we're trying to do is think about how to root out the, the, the bad apples. Is that, I mean, they're, they're kind of different, different things to me. I, I, I mean, you think it's, it's hard to root out the bad apples. Right? I mean, because let's be honest, they can hide very well. You know, if, if someone is preying on somebody and has been doing it for a long time, they've got good at hiding it or intimidate people to the point where they're not going to acknowledge it. So, I mean, diligence is, of course, the key within the, as professionals that we police ourselves. I mean, most professional, professionals and professional positions say the best way to resolve bad apples is to police yourself. Which means we all should be working together to protect each other, to look for people who can be threatened. So if we're bringing, if we got a graduate program and we know we've got a colleague that we may love them professionally. We know that there have been issues with them when they take students. We should be willing to step up and tell them and say, you know, I won't serve on the committee with this person for this reason. For this reason. You know, and so therefore, if I went work with a student, they cannot have this person on the committee. Um, but, but that would be saying that as a professor, you got to be willing to do that. I was going to say, I was just speaking on this now in the professional world. I was gonna, I was kind of thinking, you know, it's gonna take kind of an institutional shift because I know as a student, a lot of people, you know, people have reputations and people talk, you know, that that's the way it is. Oh, but it's worth it because you specialize in that, or she specializes in that. You know, the person you want know, to go work with, and the other part of it doesn't really matter. But maybe it's time to. That's, that's not okay, you know, it's not worth it. Let's consider this just as being a background child, or what's actually like, I don't know, boy club, or, you know, let's actually kind of take a, a shift in what we think is okay as far as what's allowed to kind of go on in the background. Like so maybe they are great, great at what they do, or, you know, they do great research, but they're not. Yeah, thank you for pulling up that comment. I think um, it just uh, reminded me also maybe discussing um, the the wider picture about uh, uh, issues like um, uh, there there are I think more women now doing archaeology, but the power dynamic hasn't really changed. More, there's still mostly men in senior positions, and whether or not this is affecting it, and speaking to the issues of STEM and and women dropping out of STEM possibly because of this issue, I've I've um, had conversations with um, uh, Lynn Goldstein. Uh, she and Barbara Mills are um, looking at um, gender problems with getting uh, grants, um, I think it's the NSF grant, um, yeah, the NSF grant, 
um, and possibly, uh, you know, this stemming, this being a contributing factor as well. Because um, I know there was talks about, you know, well maybe, because uh, I had brought up to her as well as, well, who's actually going after the grants? Is it really, you know, um, because maybe there are more women in CRM than there are in academics? Those are those are things to look at as well. But um, I think um, it'd be really great to hear from the panelists about just these wider issues. And, and uh, I had posed in the email for the panelists, um, uh, do you think perhaps this um, may also be contributing to a uh, the continued underrepresentation of um, minorities who are doing archaeology. Um, if, if anyone wants to. So I think that actually ties in with you know, the question that was just asked. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, part of it comes down to this larger issue of what do you, how, how, are, you, how are you approaching it? Like, the, even, if, even if Lynn finds out that, you know, fewer women are getting NSF because women are applying for them, but there are still more women in archaeology, that's an issue, right? I mean, there's an issue that why are they not then not applying? Right? Um, and, and you use the, the female pronoun in your example. Um, you know, I don't know if that's only female or the male sort of issue, but you know, building people's self-esteem, building people's self-worth so that they they will, you know, because most, most heterosexual white men don't have an issue with self-esteem. So they're like, oh yeah, I'm good, I'll go to the head and speak. This is how I perceive the world. Like, oh yeah, I'll just walk through that and run. Um, and so they, they apply for grants. And, you know, my attitude would be, well, I'm, no, I'm not going to go hang out with that predatory person because there's probably a book on that topic that I can be in and traumatized, right? And so that's, I mean, that's clearly not the decision that everyone is making, and so how do we how do we instill like that that privilege that that, that, that white males sort of wander into by by birth into everybody else? Like that's that's a I don't know how to do that. But I think that's that would be that would solve a lot of sort of concerns. <laughs> Whoa, we're almost out of time. Do we have five hours? Yeah, well, where are we Right, but I mean, another way to think about that is that's sort of an attitude and value whereby you're sort of running roughshod over you know, other people's lives and feelings yeah. and so on. So, do we want that? There are other there are other values, than, you know, the sort of individual, and, you know, the strength of the individual and the ability to you know, control their, their destiny and so forth. I mean, this, you know, this is wrapped up in the issue of what privilege as well. So I mean, when one begins to devalue, if you will, that and begin to think about just sort of more communal ways of living and, and so forth, and, and the staff can essentially adopt a different value system, consensus building, you know, these sorts of things, and it, it leads one to think about how one gets by in the world in a very different way and what's important. Is that great? It's so I know that student is very important thank you. Um, I guess my, my question is that as an, as, a, as an organization, as archaeologists, that have to then operate in this larger world that may not be quite ready to adopt that approach. Uh, would we be hamstringing ourselves to do that? Or, or could we be able to be able to shift back and forth perhaps? Is that ideal? Well, you know, I mean, if you sort of follow a lot of the AR principles, if you will, I mean, it's, it's really dehumanizing. To live, to live that way, if you will, to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of a larger conversation. But, you know, what are our values? Yeah. So, for example, let me just give a very simple example. And, uh, you know, when we show up for a meeting and so forth, you know, for me, if it's 1 o'clock, I'm there at 12.59, and come 1 o'clock, I'm ready to jump into the business, and I'm like, you know, because I'm the efficient guy, right? But I meet with some other people who have different values, and they stroll in, whatever, they visit with each other a little, and check in, how's it going, so on and so forth. Hey, our hour's gone. We didn't even get our business done. It's okay. See you next time. Very, very different way of looking at the world. Now, you know, and it's not, not sort of either or, you know, it's kind of being both, and, you know, that's the stuff that I'm struggling with right now. 
Um, because we do live in this wider world. So, but I'm willing to consider what some of these other values, what, what they bring to us, and so on. And building relationships, I think, is really important. And it might help to actually obviate some of, the, some of the other issues that we find ourselves confronted with if we actually build a, build a different society, try to build a different society. It might seem idealistic, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start there. Well, thank you. Uh, did anybody else on the panel want to contribute? Otherwise, um, I think maybe uh, we have a, a bit more time to perhaps go into any additional topics. Um, wanted to open up the floor for Q&A for the panelists. Um, and if not that, maybe bring up some other topics. But um, does anyone want to just have any questions? Okay. Um, well, there was a an interesting um, topic to to get into if if we you know, in this uh, little bit of time left in the panel. Um, uh, when I initially started um, asking questions for panelists, um, the the first year Lewis and I did this, um, uh, we had a panelist that um, wrote me back and had had talked to me about um, uh, disability. And um, I'd love to have a conversation about disability in, in archaeology. Um, this individual didn't feel like they could really, they, they, they said, you know, I'd never really want to have an open conversation about it because I don't want to be the poster child for it. Um, and in and of itself, of course, is, is difficult and, and an issue if no one's really honestly <laughs> wanting to talk about it. But these are common issues with other things that, you know, like dealing with you know, gender and minority and LGBTQ issues, you know, no one, it, no one totally really wants to be the, the poster person um, because they then... Well, because I, I remember the conversation we had about it because one of the things she's looking is like, well, accessibility for persons with disabilities. And it's not like they can go to a field school get down and actually work necessarily in units. They may want to do the work and they, want, they may love the idea, but there's no way to include them in some cases in doing what it is they want to do. And so what is it we as a profession could do to make things more accessible? I mean, and, and, and because they're wanting to be able to do the same work, the same job everybody else is doing, but how, to, how do you do it without Making a lot of rules, making a lot of demands for accessibility. I mean, because we've all we all we all, we got all these rules and regulations permeating the uh, American School of Gap that say here's what you have to do for accessibility. Um, but you can't really put those rules in place necessarily on an archaeological site. So how do we make the archaeological site a place that someone with a disability could actually work? So, not to reinvent the wheel, uh, there's a report, Archaeology and Disability, uh, it was done in the UK 2004-2005. Um, lots of really great suggestions, and it's, well, they did several reports, several hundred pages long, so I probably can sum them up in the next, like, two hours if I try. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they have a, a whole bunch of recommendations, and I would say, if you're interested, in doing that, um, check out that report. And their common, so a general theme is uh, a problem that tends to happen is we say, oh, well, it's rough terrain. You couldn't have someone out there with a wheelchair. And you'd be surprised how, how people with wheelchairs, where they can go and what they can do and how you can include them. Um, and so I think the general theme of that report is we give up a little too soon. Yeah. And you can actually do an incredible amount of stuff. And uh, I mean, they have they have things with the uh, so community and public archaeology is a little more developed in the UK than in other parts of the world. And a lot of that has to do with funding. And there's HLF, which is heritage lottery funding, and so obviously competitive grants. And so you do actually get a lot of targeting of special groups. And there have been a lot of work working with people with disabilities. Um, so people in say a wheelchair. You actually just get a, a hoe, and that works just as well as a trial. I mean, it's a trial, 
basically with just a very long handle. And so you can actually figure out ways quite easy to get people in the trench, if not actually in the trench. Um, so there are ways, and I think, um, Jeff, can I read that report? Yeah, I need to because being a field archaeologist, I will be disabled one day. <laughs> That's exactly right. I, I was laughing myself because I think, um, I think one of the, I had mentioned earlier being, you know, entry level staff and we had a lot of, you know, shovel bum sites coming through and I actually think it was was one of them who told, who told me, yeah, you know what they call archaeologists, right? I was like, no, oh, but divorced alcoholics with bad backs. <laughs> that, that was the same See, that's the guy the, I was referencing earlier. That's the, I, I love the joke, yeah. but that's the kind of thing that when I'm speaking to someone and kind of tell them you're professional, mm -hmm. that's the kind of joke I try to... God. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's, it, it's, it's, it's great, but it's also defacing at the same time. Mm -hmm. it's, you're professional. Well, it's true we want to be perceived as professionals, but the reality of um, the fact that, um, you know, when I was um, 22, I could put in 70 shovel tests a day, yeah. and I was walking all over everybody else, and I, that's how I got famous. That's how I made my business, that's how I got my clients, was because that was what I did. I was a, um, an awesome field archaeologist. I could find projectile points where there, you know, where nobody else could. And that worked for a few years. You know, I'm 52 now, right? I'm real good at being on the phone and going to meetings and sh showing people how to sharpen trowels and telling them to straighten their walls in CRM. The truth is, is the idea that somebody has a disability and that I would even characterize somebody as having a disability is, um, I don't even know, I don't even, we don't even yeah. do it. It's like, so what can you do? What can you do? Because the reality of field work and what I do is, yeah, we get excavation once a year, maybe. Um, but we're working 365 days a year. so. Um, to do my business, to keep my bottom line, to pay my people's mortgages, um, using a trowel and a shovel is one very small part of it. So what can you do? Are you good at IT? You know, can you talk to people? Can you run numbers for me? How is your word processing skills? You know, how are you at spreadsheets? So in my business, the business of CRM, I don't know, disability doesn't even count. And the more experience you have, and the more skills that you have in other things, uh, that just makes you valuable. The same with the idea that um, if you are older, you can't get a job in CRM. No, you might just need to learn some new skills. You know, I'm not there to show the tests every day. I suppose I might like to dig a few, but um, I'm not going to be digging 70 and not in wake the next morning. So, I don't know. I have all different kinds of people that work for me. I, when somebody has a disability, it's like, yeah, maybe I'm not taking the wheelchairs out to um, do excavation, but yeah, I, there's a lot of things that can happen. And that's true for everybody. Not everybody's good with a trowel. I mean, honestly, 20% well, of the people that come through my shop are good with a trowel. Really, seriously. Keeping a straight wall, yeah, maybe 20%. So you get them somewhere else, get them on something else. So this may be a whole separate panel discussion, but just thinking about harassment, kind of what you were just saying, Kelly. Um, I wonder how we're going to deal with sort of the rise in like high functioning autism. Some people see oh, that yeah. as a disability, but. Ooh, not in archaeology. Yes, <laughs> 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 uh, 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 none of us were tested. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> That's just something I, I was talking to um, another colleague here yesterday about that. Um, and he's actually a lawyer. He's involved with the uh, Underwater Archaeological Society. But he sees that in his profession, just there's kind of this cresting tide. Asperger's started being diagnosed about 15 years ago. Um, and now a lot of 20 year old people are kind of entering that job market. I just I wonder if that's something we're going to start seeing in archaeology more, maybe. And then, and then if we do, how do we deal with it? Some people with that 
ability. You know, they may be more um, offensive to others, or they're not understanding stuff, and that might be something we have to deal with. Yeah, uh, some resources. There's Archaeologists for Autism as an organization. Um, MOLAS, which is Museum of London Archaeology. <coughs> Someone over there put together a pamphlet, a non hundred percent sure, or maybe a workbook and something. I'm working with colleagues in archaeology with autism. And in about two or three days, there'll be a video on YouTube from a presentation given about two weeks ago on hard work with people with autism. It was an excellent presentation. I learned quite a bit. And it is, it's different things about how you do it. So um, it turns out a lot of people with autism work better in groups and being taught in groups as opposed to one-to-one, -to -one, um, which would seem counterintuitive to me. But uh, there is resources out there um, for that. And archaeologists have started to identify it. And yeah, Molus has, a, I want to say, a book or a pamphlet on how to work with colleagues in archaeology. What YouTube channel? Uh, it would be my YouTube channel. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. It's, it's a recording archaeology. So if you just put recording archaeology on, um, I'll, I'll make it live this evening and you can find it. It'll, but it's uh, basically archaeology and autism. It's the, if you put that into YouTube, it'll come up after I make it live in 20 minutes. <laughs> and actually, I wrote you about an email this past year from SHA about uh, donating to uh, archaeology for autism. SHA supported it by sort of doing an email blast and encouraging folks to donate to it. It's a good night for that. All right. I think if, if there are any more questions or comments, we might just uh, wrap it up. So thanks everyone for coming. And um, if anyone is interested, uh, I'd love to get those folks that are still in the room on um, their email addresses. I'd love to just um, uh, send out a couple of emails about um, your thoughts about uh, the panel today. Um, Lewis and I will be continuing this panel next year. Our goal um, is to do possibly one panel after next year's and then um, do a article to discuss the overall uh, discussion and, and results of, uh, of, of what will probably be five years of just getting comments and, and uh, hearing, what, um, hearing what people want to talk about um, with the opportunity of uh, senior managers and, um, and uh, high lo higher level academics, if not uh, tenured academics. So um, thank you for coming. And, uh, Thank you, panelists. Thanks.